Chapter 7 The Chase Begins At nine o'clock the next morning, Bond phoned the headquarters of the Secret Intelligence Service in London. Goldfinger is leaving Britain today, he told them. He's going to Europe. He's flying from Ferryfield Airport. But I don't know when. He's taking his Rolls Royce. I want to follow him and put a Homer transmitting device in his car. A few minutes later, the SIS called Bond. They said that Goldfinger was booked on a flight to Le Touquet in France. The flight was leaving at midday. Bond paid his hotel bill and left Ramsgate. He drove to Ferryfield Airport and got there at about 11 o'clock. The SIS had already phoned the customs officers at the airport. They had asked the customs officers to help Bond. Bond parked his car where Goldfinger would not see it and waited. At quarter to twelve, Goldfinger and Oddjob arrived in the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. They got onto the plane, and the customs officers took Goldfinger's car into the customs area. There was only one other car there, a small, pale, grey Triumph sports car. Bond took the Homer transmitting device out of his pocket and fixed it into the compartment of Goldfinger's car where tools are kept. Then the customs officers drove the Rolls-Royce onto the plane. Bond's Aston Martin had a special receiver which would pick up signals from the Homer. It could pick up signals from a distance of up to 100 miles. Bond would be able to follow Goldfinger without Goldfinger seeing him. Bond took the 2 p.m. flight to Le Touquet. As soon as he left the airport at Le Touquet, he switched on the receiver in his car. It picked up the signal from the Homer in Goldfinger's car and started to make a low humming sound. Bond followed the sound made by the Homer. Goldfinger was moving through France in a southeasterly direction. Goldfinger drove all afternoon, and Bond followed. As it became dark, they reached the old town of Orléans. Suddenly Bond saw another car in front of his car. It was a small, pale, grey Triumph sports car. Bond passed it and saw Goldfinger's car ahead. He slowed down. He didn't want Goldfinger to know that he was being followed. That night, Goldfinger stayed at a very expensive hotel, while Bond stayed in a small hotel near the railway station. At six o'clock the next morning, Bond was ready and waiting in his car outside Goldfinger's hotel. At half-past eight, Goldfinger and Oddjob came out of the hotel and got into the Rolls-Royce. They drove off, and Bond followed. Bond was enjoying himself. He was driving along by the River Loire. It was early summer, and the French countryside was very beautiful. Suddenly, a small Triumph sports car drove past. It was the same car that he'd passed the evening before in Orléans. He could see the driver, a pretty girl wearing a pink scarf over her dark hair. Bond looked at the girl with interest. He loved pretty girls, and it was a perfect day for romance. He wished that he could drive after her and catch up with her. But this was no time for love. He was on a mission. His job was to follow Goldfinger. Then Bond realized that he'd seen that triumph before. It had been at Ferryfield Airport, and also in Orléans. Was this a coincidence? Or was the girl following Goldfinger too? Bond would have to get rid of her. The job of following Goldfinger was already difficult, and Bond didn't want this girl to make things more difficult. Bond drove on, following the strong, clear signal from the Homer. Suddenly, as he drove over the top of a hill, Bond saw that the Rolls-Royce had stopped by the side of the road. The car was about half a mile ahead of him. Bond stopped, too, and took a small pair of binoculars out of a compartment in the Aston Martin. He saw Goldfinger sitting beside a small bridge that crossed a river. He was eating a sandwich. Goldfinger finished eating and got up. Bond saw him place something carefully on the ground close to the stone wall of the bridge. Then Goldfinger got back into the Rolls-Royce and drove off. Bond drove quickly down to the bridge and searched the ground beside it. Next to the stone wall of the bridge, hidden under some grass, there was something hard and heavy. Bond pulled a gold bar out of the grass. Had Goldfinger put the bar there for one of the Smirsch agents to collect? Well, Bond would make sure that they wouldn't find it. He carried the bar back to the Aston Martin 
and put it in the secret compartment under the passenger seat. Bond drove off quickly and caught up at the Rolls-Royce before it reached the next town, Macon. The road divided at Macon, the right turning led to Lyon in France, the left turning led to Geneva in Switzerland. Which way was Goldfinger going? The Rolls-Royce took the left turning. Goldfinger was going to Switzerland. Suddenly, Bond looked in his driving mirror and saw the little grey triumph immediately behind him. He'd been so busy following the Rolls-Royce that he'd forgotten the girl. Bond was angry. Now he must make sure that she couldn't follow any further. This was a perfect opportunity to get her car off the road. Bond pressed down hard on his brakes, and his car stopped at once. The Triumph crashed straight into the back of the Aston Martin. Bond's car wasn't damaged, but the radiator of the Triumph was badly smashed. The girl got out of her car. She was extremely angry. You stupid idiot! Why did you do that? she shouted. I can't drive my car now. I'm terribly sorry, said Bond politely. I'll pay for the damage, and I'll pay for your hotel this evening. I'm sure that your car can be repaired by tomorrow morning. No, said the girl in a cool, angry voice. I can't stay here in Macon. I've got an important meeting in Geneva. I have to get there this evening. Will you take me in your car, please? Bond looked at the girl. She was very beautiful, with dark blue eyes and black hair. Why was she chasing Goldfinger? All right, he said. I'll be happy to take you to Geneva. Go and get your things. The girl went to her car and took out a small suitcase and a bag of golf clubs. What's your name? Bond asked. And which hotel are you staying at? The Hotel de Berg, and my name is Soames, Miss Tilly Soames. A few minutes later, they were on their way to Geneva. Bond could still hear the signal from the Homer, but the low humming sound wasn't loud. The Rolls-Royce must be about fifty miles ahead, he thought. He glanced at the girl in the passenger seat. How long are you going to stay in Geneva? he asked. I don't know. I'm playing in the Swiss Open Golf Championship for women. Bond was sure that the girl wasn't telling him all of the truth, and she didn't talk very much to him for the rest of the journey. They drove over the mountains and crossed the border from France into Switzerland. When they reached Geneva, Bond stopped at the Hotel de Berg. He gave the girl some money, and he apologized again for the damage to her car. She got out of the Aston Martin, thanked him coldly, and walked into the hotel. Now Bond had to catch up with Goldfinger again. The sound from the Homer had got much louder. He drove fast through Geneva and saw the yellow Rolls Royce just before they arrived at a small village called Coppe. The car was turning in through big iron gates in a high wall. A sign on the wall said, Enterprises Auric. Bond drove past the gates and took the next turning off the road. A narrow lane led up into some woods. Bond stopped the Aston Martin and turned off the engine. He took the binoculars, got out of the car, and walked silently through the trees. When he came to a very large tree, he hid behind it and looked through his binoculars. From this position, Bond could see down to the buildings of Enterprises Auric. Below him, there was a large courtyard. Around the sides of the courtyard, there was an old house and some workshops. At the corner of one of the workshops, there was a tall, thin chimney with a square piece of metal on the top. The piece of metal was turning round and round. It looked like a kind of radar scanner. The Rolls Royce Silver Ghost was standing in the middle of the courtyard. As Bond watched, the door of the house opened and Goldfinger came out with four men. To Bond's surprise, they began to take parts off the car. They took the doors off the car and they removed the armor plating from inside the door panels. Suddenly, Odd Job appeared in the doorway of the house. He made a sign to Goldfinger, and Goldfinger went inside. It was time for Bond to leave. He looked around for the last time, then went back quietly through the trees to his car. Bond took the gold bar that he'd found under the bridge to the British SIS agent in Geneva. He asked the agent to send the bar to M in London. Do you know anything about Enterprises Auric at Coppe? Bond asked the agent. Enterprises Auric makes metal furniture, replied the agent. 
It's very good quality. The company makes seats for the planes of a big Indian airline, Mecca Airlines. Suddenly, Bond understood everything about Goldfinger's business. The smuggling operation had been like a puzzle with a piece missing, but now Bond had got the missing piece of information. Now he knew how the gold was being smuggled out of Britain and sold in India. Goldfinger was using his Rolls Royce to smuggle it. Goldfinger had bought the Rolls Royce because it was special. It had been made with heavy armor plating in its doors. Bond remembered what he'd seen at Reculver. He'd seen the metal plates being fixed on the car at Goldfinger's factory. Then he'd seen the armor plating taken off again at Goldfinger's factory at Coppe. But the armor plating on the Rolls Royce Silver Ghost wasn't ordinary metal. It was gold, white gold. Goldfinger drove his car to Switzerland twice a year. Before he left Britain, his workmen at his factory in Reculver took the armor plating out of the car's doors. They replaced the ordinary metal panels with panels of white gold. The white gold was the same color as the armor plating, so customs officials at the airport never suspected that the car's doors were really made of white gold. Then Goldfinger drove the Rolls Royce to his factory in Switzerland. At his factory at Coppe, workmen removed the white gold panels from Goldfinger's car and replaced them with ordinary armor plating again. The panels of white gold were melted in the blast furnaces at Coppe and made into seats for Mecca Airlines planes. Then the Mecca planes were flown to India. In India, the seats were taken out of the planes and replaced with ordinary metal seats. In this way, the gold was smuggled into India, where it was sold. Goldfinger was making a lot of money for Smirsch. It was a very clever operation. Chapter Eight: Death by Gold. After he left the SIS agent in Geneva, Bond drove to the Hotel de Berg and booked a room. He asked the receptionist if Miss Tilly Soames was in her room, but the receptionist said that no one of that name was staying at the hotel. Bond wasn't surprised. He'd suspected that the girl hadn't told him her real name. Bond had a shower, dressed. And put on a pair of shoes with a small knife hidden in one of the heels. Then he drove to a small restaurant by Lake Geneva for dinner. While he ate, he thought about Goldfinger's smuggling operation. Bond decided to go back to Goldfinger's factory at Coppe and look for some white gold dust. He would send some of the dust to the headquarters of the SIS in London. The dust would prove that Goldfinger was smuggling gold out of Britain. Then the Secret Service would inform the police, and Goldfinger would be arrested. A little after eight o'clock, Bond paid his restaurant bill and got into the Aston Martin. He drove to the narrow lane in the woods above Goldfinger's factory. Then he got out of the car and walked quietly through the trees. The moon was shining brightly, and there was no wind. After walking for a few minutes, Bond saw the outline of the factory buildings below him. He could just hear the thump, thump, thump sound of a powerful engine. Bond stepped slowly and quietly through the trees, moving small branches carefully out of his way. When he came to the large tree, he stopped in surprise. A body was lying on the ground in front of him. The body moved a little. By the light of the moon, Bond saw something made of shiny metal. He also saw that the person had black hair. A black sweater and narrow black trousers. It was the girl, Tilly. She was watching the factory buildings, and she was holding a rifle. Bond breathed slowly. He studied the distance between him and the girl. Tilly hadn't heard him approach. Suddenly, he leapt onto her back and pressed his left hand over her mouth. At the same time, he grabbed the rifle with his right hand and threw it onto the ground a few feet away. Then he held her hands behind her back. The girl tried to fight Bond, but he was stronger and heavier than she was. She couldn't push Bond off her back, so she tried to bite his hand. Bond put his mouth close to her ear and whispered quickly, "Tilly, lie quietly. This is me, Bond. I'm a friend. Will you lie quietly and listen?" At last, the girl nodded her head. 
Bond slid off her and lay beside her, but he still held her hands behind her back. Were you following Goldfinger? he asked. Yes. I was going to kill him, the girl whispered fiercely. Then her whole body began to shake and she started to cry softly. Bond let go of Tilly's hands and touched her hair gently. He looked down through the trees at the factory buildings. Something was different there. It was the radar scanner on top of the tall chimney. The scanner wasn't turning round any more. It had stopped moving and it was pointing in their direction. Don't cry, Bond whispered. I'm chasing Goldfinger too. I've been sent by my organization in London. They want him. What did he do to you? He killed my sister, replied Tilly. You knew her, Jill Masterton. What happened? asked Bond. He was shocked. Jill called me from a hospital in Miami. She was dying. I went to her at once. She told me what Goldfinger had done to her. She died the same night. What had he done? asked Bond. Goldfinger was angry because Jill went to New York with you. When she returned to Miami, he gave an order for Jill to be killed. He ordered his Korean servant to paint all of her body with paint. Gold paint. If you cover someone completely in paint, your skin can't breathe and you die. Jill told me about you. She liked you. Bond closed his eyes. He remembered how beautiful Jill had been and the wonderful time that they had spent together. He felt sad and very angry. He'd asked Goldfinger about Jill two days before. Goldfinger had replied, She left my employment. But Jill hadn't left her job with Goldfinger. She'd been murdered by him. Suddenly there was a sharp noise by Bond's head. A metal arrow flew through the air and struck the large tree in front of Bond. Immediately Bond turned his head. He saw the dark figure of a man standing ten yards away. The person was wearing a bowler hat. It was odd job. He was getting ready to fire a second arrow from a long metal bow. Don't move, whispered Bond to the girl. Hello, odd job, he said more loudly. He stood up in front of Tilly, trying to protect her with his own body. Odd job held the bow so that the arrow was pointing at Bond's stomach. Then Odd job quickly moved his head sideways and downwards towards the house. He didn't speak. You want us to go down there? said Bond. All right. Bond knew that he couldn't win in a fight against Odd job. Odd job was like a fighting machine. They would have to do what Odd job wanted. Come on, Bond said to the girl, and he led her away from the rifle on the ground so that Odd job wouldn't see it. They walked slowly down the hill with Odd job just behind them. Bond talked softly to the girl. We'll tell Goldfinger that you're my girlfriend, he said quietly. We'll say that I brought you here. Don't try to do anything. He nodded his head back towards Oddjob. This man is a killer. Then Bond noticed something. The radar scanner on the tall chimney had started turning round again. The machine must have detected their movements when they were in the woods. So Goldfinger had known that there were strangers near his factory, and he'd sent Oddjob to get them. Bond, Tilly, and Oddjob reached the courtyard of the house. The back door opened, and two of Goldfinger's Korean servants ran out, carrying long sticks. They searched Bond and Tilly for weapons, but they didn't find any. Then Oddjob pushed Bond and the girl through the door and along a passage. The Korean servant stopped and knocked on the door leading off the passage. Yes, said a voice inside the room. Oddjob opened the door and pushed Bond and Tilly through the doorway. Goldfinger sat at a big desk covered with papers. He was wearing a purple velvet jacket over a white silk shirt. He looked at Bond with his cruel, pale eyes. He didn't look at the girl. Goldfinger, said Bond in an angry voice, what's the problem? This is my girlfriend, Miss Soames. Odd job almost killed us in the woods. If you don't answer me and apologize, Goldfinger, I'll call the police. Goldfinger continued to stare at Bond. At last he spoke. Mr. Bond, he said, the gangsters in Chicago say this. If you meet someone for the first time, it's by chance. 
The second time you meet them, it's by coincidence. But if you meet them for a third time, it's time for enemy action. We met in Miami, Sandwich, and now here. I'm going to get the truth out of you, Mr. Bond. Our job? Take them into the factory. Bond leapt across the desk and attacked Goldfinger. The top of Bond's head crashed into Goldfinger's body and knocked him off his chair. The two men fell to the floor together, and Bond's fingers went around Goldfinger's throat. Then something heavy hit Bond's head, and he slid off Goldfinger's body onto the floor and lay still. He was unconscious. Chapter 9 Project Grand Slam When Bond became conscious again and opened his eyes, a powerful bright light was shining above him. He tried to move, but he couldn't. He was lying on a metal table, and his hands and feet were tied to it. Now we can begin, he heard Goldfinger's voice say. Bond turned his head to the left and saw Goldfinger sitting in a chair. There was a control panel on a small table beside him. Tilly was sitting on the other side of the table. Her hands and feet were tied to a chair. There was a shocked expression on her pale, beautiful face. Bond turned his head to the right. Odd Job was standing a few feet away. The Korean was wearing his bowler hat, but he'd taken off his jacket and shirt. The light shone on the powerful muscles of his arms and chest. Bond lifted his head and looked round the room. They were in one of the factory rooms. Then he looked down at the table where he was lying. It had a long, narrow slot down the center, and at the end he saw the sharp teeth of a large, circular saw. Mr. Bond, said Goldfinger, I know that you and this girl are my enemies. I've given the girl drugs to make her talk. She has told me that she came here to kill me. Perhaps you came here to kill me too. Now, tell me the truth. Talk! Goldfinger pressed a button on the control panel, and a high, whistling sound came from the circular saw. The sharp blade was spinning round as the saw began to move forward, very slowly towards Bond. The blade would continue along the narrow slot in the centre of the table and up between Bond's legs. It was going to kill him, slowly, by cutting his body into two pieces. Now, Mr. Bond, said Goldfinger, tell me everything that you know about my business and you'll die quickly. The girl will die quickly also. If you talk... I'll give each of you a drug, and there will be no pain. If you don't talk, you'll die slowly, and in great pain, and the girl will watch. Then I'll give her to odd job. So, what do you want to do? Don't be a fool, Goldfinger, said Bond. I told my employers at Universal Export where I was going, and why. Universal is very powerful, and they'll send the police here to find us. I'm afraid that you don't understand, Mr. Bond, said Goldfinger, smiling. If the police come here, none of my staff will talk to them. Now tell me the truth. Who are you? Who sent you here? What do you know? The saw is now moving towards your body at about one inch every minute. Bond was silent. Our job, Goldfinger said to his servant. Mr. Bond needs some help to make him talk. Persuade him to talk. The servant stepped towards the table. The high, whistling sound of the saw was getting louder as it got nearer to Bond's body. Then our job's powerful fingers began to press and strike Bond's body again and again and again. The pain was terrible. Bond wanted to die, die quickly. After many minutes, our job stopped hitting him. Goldfinger, said Bond, slowly in a weak voice. I'll make a bargain with you. The girl and I will work for you, okay? And I must wait for you to kill me one day, said Goldfinger. No, thank you, Mr. Bond. Bond decided that it was time to stop talking. He could feel the movement of the spinning saw between his legs. He closed his eyes and tried to scream, but he couldn't. Then he tried to stop breathing. Die, he told himself angrily. Die! Bond dreamt that he was flying through darkness. I must have died and I'm on my way to heaven, he thought. Then he heard a voice say, This is your captain speaking. We will be landing soon. 
Please fasten your seatbelts. Thank you. If Bond was on a plane, where was it going? He couldn't understand what had happened. He tried to think, but he was extremely tired. He couldn't move. Then he fell unconscious again. When he woke up, he was lying on a bed in a bright white room. It looked like the health department of an airport. Tilly was lying next to him on another bed. A door opened and two men entered the room. The first man was a doctor. He was dressed in a white coat and he was carrying a medical bag. The other man was Goldfinger. The two men stopped between Bond and Tilly's beds. Doctor, they're looking much better, said Goldfinger in a gentle voice. They're both members of my staff and they've been working too hard. They've both had nervous breakdowns. Their minds and their bodies are exhausted. They've been very ill. So I'm taking them to the best private hospital in America. Doctor, said Bond, there's nothing wrong with me or this girl. Neither of us has ever worked for Goldfinger. He tied us up, tortured us, and gave us drugs. Please believe me. Bond's voice was slow and weak. He couldn't lift his head from the bed. The doctor looked worried and turned to Goldfinger. Goldfinger shook his head slowly. I'm very sad to see a man so sick in his mind, he said. You'll be all right, James, he said kindly, smiling at Bond. Don't worry, we'll look after you. The doctor will give you a drug to help you to sleep. Goldfinger turned towards the doctor and spoke gently. Please, help him, doctor. Yes, of course, said the doctor, and he took a needle on a syringe out of his bag. A moment later, Bond felt the sharp needle go into his arm. He opened his mouth and tried to scream. Then he fell unconscious again. The next time that Bond woke up, he was lying on a bed in a grey room with no windows. He was feeling very hungry and thirsty. When had he last eaten any food? Two, three days ago? Bond sat up slowly. He was dressed in his underwear, but where were the rest of his clothes? He put his feet down on the floor and tried to stand. The only furniture in the room was a bed, a table, and a chair. Bond's clothes were lying under the bed. His shoes were there too. Bond checked inside the heel of one of them. Good. The knife was still hidden in its secret compartment. There were two doors in the room. One was locked and the other led into a bathroom. Bond went into the bathroom and saw a third door. He opened it and saw Tilly Masterton lying on a bed in another room. She was sleeping peacefully. Bond went into the bathroom. He shaved and had a shower. Then he went back into his room and put on his clothes and shoes. Suddenly the locked door opened, and Oddjob came in. Oddjob, I'm hungry, said Bond at once. Bring me something to eat and tell Goldfinger that I want to talk to him. Oddjob looked at Bond angrily. Then he left the room and locked the door. A few minutes later, another Korean servant arrived with a tray of food. Bond ate hungrily. It was an excellent meal. The door opened again, and Goldfinger came in. He was holding a small gun, and it was pointed at Bond. Mr. Bond, don't try to attack me, said Goldfinger. If you do... I'll shoot you. I was going to kill you in Switzerland, but you said something that saved your life. You wanted to make a bargain with me. You said that you and Miss Masterton would work for me if I let you live. By coincidence, I'm just about to start a big project, and I need more staff. So I didn't kill you. I drugged both of you, and I collected your things from the Hotel de Berg. Then I brought you here to New York. What work do you want us to do? asked Bond. Mr. Bond, I love gold, said Goldfinger, his eyes shining with pleasure. I love the color, the smell, and the feel of gold. I own about twenty million pounds worth of gold. It's all here in New York, and I'll do anything to get more gold. Now I'm about to start the biggest project of my life. It's a robbery. A huge robbery. The project will need a lot of preparation and paperwork. You and Miss Masterton will work for me. 
You'll be my secretaries. When the project is finished, I will pay you both with gold. What are you going to do? asked Bond. I'm going to steal fifteen billion dollars worth of gold bullion. That's approximately half the supply of gold in the world. Our project, Mr. Bond, will be to rob the bullion depository at Fort Knox. Fort Knox, said Bond, but that's impossible. It has more guards than any other place in the United States. How can two men and a girl rob it? I'll have help from one hundred other people. Men and women from the six most powerful gangs in America. I've invited the six bosses of these gangsters to a meeting here at half past two this afternoon. I'll answer all your questions then. Goldfinger went out and shut the door. Bond walked through into Tilly's room. Tilly had woken up and was putting her shoes on. She didn't look very pleased to see Bond. He told her about Goldfinger's plan to rob Fort Knox, and that Goldfinger wanted them to be his secretaries. Then he knocked on the door for Oddjob and ordered some breakfast for Tilly. When Oddjob came back with the food, he was carrying a typewriter, some paper, and a page of instructions. The instructions were to Bond from Goldfinger. Prepare ten copies of this agenda. Agenda for a meeting with Helmut M. Springer, the Purple Gang, Detroit. Jed Midnight, the Shadow Syndicate, Miami and Havana; Billy Ring, the Machine, Chicago; Jack Strap, the Spangled Mob, Las Vegas; Mr. Solo, Unione Siciliano; Miss Pussy Galore, the Cement Mixers, Harlem and New York City. Chairman of the meeting, Mr. Gold; Mr. Gold's secretaries, J. Bond and Tilly Masterton, for a project to be called. Grand slam. Bond sat down at the typewriter and made ten copies of the agenda. He finished typing them by two o'clock, and at twenty past two, Oddjob came to fetch Bond and Tilly. They followed him along a passage and into the meeting room. Goldfinger sat with his back to the window. A large round table was in front of him. There were nine comfortable chairs round the table, and in front of six of the chairs were pens, notepads. And small white parcels. On one of the walls of the room, there was a large blackboard. Below this, there was a long table with bottles of champagne and dishes of caviar on it. Goldfinger told Tilly to sit in the chair on his left, and he told Bond to sit in the chair on his right. Bond handed him the copies of the agenda. Miss Masterton, you will take notes at this meeting," ordered Goldfinger. "Mr. Bond." You will watch the people at the meeting very carefully. If you think that any of these people won't work with me, you must mark a cross against his or her name on the agenda. Who is Miss Pussy Galore? Asked Bond. She is the only woman who runs a gang in America. She's the leader of a gang of women. I shall need some women for my project. A bell rang softly under the table. The door at the end of the room opened, and five men came in. They walked to the table and sat down silently. Chapter Ten: The Meeting of the Gangsters. Goldfinger spoke quietly. "Welcome, gentlemen," he said. "My name is Mister Gold. In each of the parcels on the table in front of you, you will find a gold bar." Each bar is worth fifteen thousand dollars. Please accept these as gifts from me. While we are waiting for Miss Pussy Galore, let me introduce you to my secretaries, Mister Bond and Miss Masterton. Mister Bond, on your right is Mister Jed Midnight. Mister Midnight was a heavy man with a red face and large, intelligent eyes. He was wearing a light blue suit. A white silk shirt with pictures of green palm trees on it, and a large gold watch. Next to Mister Midnight is Mister Billy Ring from Chicago," said Goldfinger. Billy Ring was about forty years old and had a face that was both ugly and evil. Someone had cut off his lower lip so that his mouth always had a wide, horrible smile. Beside Mister Ring is Mister Helmut Springer from Detroit. Goldfinger said, 
Helmut Springer's eyes were like cold pieces of pale blue glass. He didn't seem very interested in Bond. Goldfinger turned towards a big, strong man with dark hair and a big nose. Welcome, Mr. Solo of the Unione Siciliano, he said, nodding at the fourth gang leader. Bond looked with interest at Mr. Solo. The head of the mafia in America. Mr. Solo was wearing large glasses and cleaning his fingernails with a knife. And Mr. Jack Strap from Las Vegas, said Goldfinger, looking at the fifth man. Jack Strap was about fifty years old and had frightening, cruel eyes. He was wearing a suit of shiny material, and he was smoking a large cigar. The door opened, and a tall, slim woman in a black suit came in. This was Miss Pussy Galore. Bond liked the look of her. She was about thirty and was very good-looking, with pale skin and short, dark hair. Her beautiful eyes were a very unusual dark violet color. She walked slowly down the room to the table and sat down beside Mr. Strap. Good afternoon, Miss Galore, said Goldfinger. The agenda is in front of you, together with a $15,000 gold bar. Miss Galore opened her parcel. Is this real gold? she asked suspiciously. She had a low, attractive voice. It's real, replied Goldfinger. And now, he continued, I'll tell you why I've invited you all here this afternoon. I've made a great amount of money, about sixty million dollars in the last twenty years. I've made this money in many different ways. Some projects have been legal, many have been illegal. But none of my projects have failed. You are the best criminals in America. I want you to work with me on the most valuable project I've ever organized. Project Grand Slam. For one week's work, you will each get one billion dollars. Everybody round the table was silent. That's a lot of money, said Jed Midnight at last. How much will you get? Five billion dollars, replied Goldfinger. Eleven billion dollars in total, said Helmut Springer. There are only three depositories in the United States where such large amounts of money are kept. Are we going to rob one of these depositories? And if so, which one? Fort Knox in Kentucky, replied Goldfinger. That's impossible, said Jed Midnight. No, said Goldfinger. Fort Knox is just like a huge bank. It's bigger, and it has better protection than other banks, but it's not impossible to break into it. You just need a good plan. But there are a lot of troops guarding Fort Knox, said Billy Ring. And these soldiers have a large number of weapons. How can we get past them? You're right, Mr. Ring, said Goldfinger. About 60,000 people live in Fort Knox, including approximately 20,000 armed troops. Now... Listen to my plan. Goldfinger walked to the blackboard and pulled down a map of Fort Knox that was fixed above it. He pointed to the left-hand corner of the map, to the bullion depository. As you'll see, he said, pointing to the map, this is where the bullion is kept. There is a railway line running through Fort Knox. The track comes from Louisville, 35 miles to the north. Near the bullion depository, there are some railway sidings. The bullion from the capital, Washington, is sent to Fort Knox. Sometimes the gold goes by rail, and sometimes it is taken by trucks along this main road, the Dixie Highway. Any questions? There were none. Goldfinger turned back to the blackboard and pulled down a second map. This was a plan of the gold vault. Inside this vault, said Goldfinger, about fifteen billion dollars worth of gold bars are kept. Now I'll tell you how we can break into the vault and steal them. Everybody was silent, listening. Each of you will have to arrange how you're going to get your share of the gold away from Fort Knox, continued Goldfinger. Each of you will have to use your own trucks and drivers. I'll be taking my share away by train. Now, 
Goldfinger went on. How do we get into Fort Knox? My plan is to put a drug in the town's water supply. This will make everyone in the area, soldiers and civilians, fall asleep for three days. While they are asleep, we'll steal the gold from the vault. But how do we put the drug in the water supply? asked Jed Midnight. Two of my staff have been invited to visit Fort Knox. They'll meet the chief engineer who controls the water supply, Goldfinger replied. My staff are pretending to be engineers from a Japanese company which is planning to use the same water system in Tokyo. My men will take the drug to the meeting. When the engineer isn't looking, they'll put it into Fort Knox water supply. That's very clever, said Mr. Jack Strap, looking at Goldfinger and smiling. How do we get into the town? We'll travel on a special train from New York, replied Goldfinger. There will be about 100 of us. We'll be dressed as workers in an emergency team which has come to help the people of the town. The ladies in Miss Pussy Galore's gang will be dressed as nurses. When the train reaches Louisville, 35 miles from the depository, Goldfinger went on, my assistant and I will enter the train driver's compartment. We'll get rid of the train driver, and I'll drive the train through Fort Knox to the sidings near the bullion depository. By this time, your trucks should be arriving too. Bodies of the sleeping people will be everywhere, but we'll take no notice of them. We'll place the trucks around the vault and go inside. But how do we get inside the vault? asked Mr. Solo. The door to the gold vault is extremely strong, and it weighs twenty tons. Goldfinger bent down and took a large, heavy box from beneath the table. He carried it carefully and placed it on the table in front of the gangsters. There is only one weapon that is powerful enough to open the gold vault, he said. I got this from a military base in Germany. It's an atomic bomb. The faces of all the people round the table went pale with fear. Bond was shocked, too. Goldfinger was a master criminal who didn't care about the lives of anyone. Don't worry, said Goldfinger. The bomb is safe at the moment. It won't explode here. It's not activated yet. What about uh, fallout when the bomb explodes at the vault? asked Billy Ring nervously. There will be very little fallout, said Goldfinger carelessly. After the bomb explodes, we will give protection suits to the men who enter the building. These suits will protect them from any fallout. What about the sleeping people? asked Mr. Solo. We'll move as many people as possible to a safe place before the bomb explodes, said Goldfinger. Bond didn't believe that Goldfinger would move the sleeping people. Bond suspected that the drug and the water supply would kill the people, not make them fall asleep. Goldfinger was only interested in stealing the gold. He wasn't interested in saving people's lives. Now, if there are no more questions, said Goldfinger, I want to know if you'll work with me on this project. Mr. Midnight, yes or no? Mr. Gold, said Jed Midnight, you're the greatest criminal that I've ever met. I'll be delighted to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Midnight. And you, Mr. Ring? A billion dollars is a lot of money, said Billy Ring. Yes, my gang and I will work with you. Good, said Goldfinger. Mr. Solo? Yes, replied Mr. Solo. I'm with you. Goldfinger looked at Jack Strap. Are you with us, Mr. Strap? he asked. Yes, me and my men will work with you replied the gangster from Las Vegas. Thank you, said Goldfinger. And you, Miss Galore? Yes, said Pussy Galore. My girls and I need the money. We'll work with you. Excellent, said Goldfinger. And what about you, Mr. Springer? Mr. Springer stood up slowly and looked round the table. Mr. Gold, 
he said. I'm afraid that the Purple Gang of Detroit won't work on this project. Good afternoon, gentlemen and madam. As Springer turned and walked towards the door, Bond saw Goldfinger's hand move under the table. He pressed the bell. Bond guessed that Goldfinger was signaling to our job. How about a drink? said Mr. Midnight. Everybody got up and walked over to the table where the drink and food were prepared. Bond poured champagne into glasses for himself, Pussy Galore, and Tilly Masterton. Goldfinger has been very clever in this meeting, thought Bond. He's persuaded almost all of the gang leaders to join his project. Suddenly the door opened and one of Goldfinger's Korean staff walked in. He went up to Goldfinger and whispered something to him. Goldfinger looked serious. Gentlemen and madam, he said sadly, I have received some terrible news. Mr. Helmut Springer has had an accident. He fell down the stairs as he was leaving the building. He died at once. Everybody in the room stared at Goldfinger. Goldfinger had signaled to Oddjob because the boss of the Purple Gang would not work on Project Grand Slam. Goldfinger had given Oddjob a secret order to kill Mr. Springer. Bond was sure of this. Goldfinger was a murderer, and he would kill anyone who didn't agree with him. And soon he was going to murder 60,000 people in Fort Knox, too. After the gang leaders left, Bond spoke to Goldfinger. Goldfinger, you'll never succeed with this crazy plan. You'll never be able to get the gold out of Fort Knox. So 60,000 people will die for nothing. Mr. Bond, said Goldfinger, I have planned everything very carefully. I need these gang leaders and their people for the robbery, but I don't care what happens to them after that. A Soviet ship will be waiting for me. I'll take my gold to the ship by train. I'll take the gold out of America to the Soviet Union. So Goldfinger is planning a huge robbery with these gang leaders, thought Bond. But the gangsters don't realize that he's working for an enemy like Smirsch. They think that he's just an ordinary criminal like themselves. Perhaps some of the gangsters would be caught or killed. Bond and Tilly would probably die too. But Goldfinger would not care. Goldfinger's Korean and German staff would sail to the USSR in the ship with their boss. It was a terrible, perfect plan. And there was only one man who could stop Goldfinger. That man was Agent 007, James Bond. But how could Bond stop him? Chapter 11 The Richest Man in the World the next day, Goldfinger gave Bond and Tilly a lot of work to do. They had to prepare maps, timetables, and lists. As they worked, Odd Job guarded them carefully. At the end of the day, Bond received a note from Goldfinger. It said, At 11 a.m. tomorrow, the five gang leaders and myself will take a plane trip. We are going to fly over Fort Knox to study the positions of the buildings and roads. The plane will be flown by my pilots. You will come with us. Miss Masterton will stay here. G. Bond sat and thought. Finally, he took a sheet of paper and typed out the details of the robbery of Fort Knox. He rolled the paper into a tiny cylinder. Then he took another sheet of paper and typed this message. Urgent. There will be a reward of $5,000 for the person who delivers this message to Felix Leiter at Pinkerton's Detective Agency, 154 Nassau Street, New York. Bond rolled the message around the cylinder of paper and wrote $5,000 reward in red ink on the outside. Then he wrapped sticky tape around the message on the cylinder. He stuck the paper cylinder to his leg with more sticky tape. The next day, Bond went in the plane with Goldfinger, Oddjob, and the five gang leaders. They flew over Fort Knox to study the plan of the town. As the plane was flying back to New York, Bond went into the toilet. He knew that this was his only opportunity to try and stop Goldfinger. Bond knew that after the plane landed, cleaners would come and clean the toilet. 
so he took the paper cylinder off his leg and stuck it under the seat of the toilet. The words, five thousand dollars reward, were very clear, and a cleaner would see it immediately. Odd Job was waiting outside the toilet. When Bond came out, Odd Job pushed past him and looked suspiciously around inside the small room. But he didn't lift the toilet seat. He came out again and shut the door. When Bond walked past her, Pussy Galore looked at him thoughtfully. During the next three days, Bond felt very nervous. He kept thinking again and again about the message under the toilet seat. Had anyone found it? Would they believe the message? Or perhaps the plane hadn't been cleaned yet? Bond thought about what would happen if the message was delivered to Felix Leiter. Felix would fly to Washington and contact the FBI and the Army. Perhaps he would even talk to the President of the United States. They would stop Goldfinger's plans. But nothing happened. Then, in the afternoon of the day before the robbery, Bond received another note from Goldfinger. It said, The first part of Project Grand Slam has been successful. Get on the train at midnight. Bring copies of all the maps, timetables, and lists. G. That evening, Goldfinger, Bond, Tilly, and the gangsters met at Pennsylvania Station. Ring, Midnight, Strap, Solo, and their men were dressed as medical workers. Pussy Galore and her girls were dressed as nurses. Goldfinger, Tilly, and Bond were dressed as doctors. The superintendent of the station approached Goldfinger. Dr. Gold, he said, I'm afraid that there's bad news from Fort Knox. All trains are being stopped at Louisville. But don't worry, we'll get you and your emergency team there. What's happened to the people at Fort Knox? What illness do they have? We don't know yet. That's what we have to find out, said Goldfinger in a gentle voice. But we believe that it's very dangerous. Well, good luck, doctor, said the superintendent. Everyone is very proud of you and your emergency team. Thank you, superintendent, said Goldfinger. He moved away and gave orders for the gangs to board the train. Bond was put in a train compartment with Tilly. They were guarded by Goldfinger's Korean and German staff. As Pussy Galore walked through the compartment where Bond and Tilly were sitting, she stopped by Bond's seat for a few seconds. Her dark, violet eyes stared into his grey-blue eyes. Mr. Bond, she whispered, if anything goes wrong with this plan, I'm sure that you'll know why. Then she walked on. It was a long and difficult journey. Some of the employees of the railway were still on the train, so the gangsters couldn't drink whiskey or smoke cigarettes or start fights. They had to behave well and pretend to be medical staff until they reached Fort Knox. Bond thought again and again about the drug in the water supply. Had the people of Fort Knox drunk the water? Were 60,000 people already dead? Or had Felix Leiter got Bond's message? Bond knew what he must do. He must get close to Goldfinger and kill him. At six o'clock the next morning, the train reached Louisville. Goldfinger said that there were not enough protection suits for everyone. So all the railway's employees left the train, except for the driver. A few minutes later, Bond felt the train almost stop, then start again. He knew that Goldfinger had killed the driver. Goldfinger was now driving the train himself. Then Mr. Strap came hurrying through Bond's compartment. We arrive in ten minutes, he ordered. Put on your protective equipment. Bond went to the toilet and closed the door. He removed the small knife from the heel of his shoe and pushed it into the belt of his trousers. Ten minutes later, the train began passing houses on the edge of Fort Knox. Bodies were lying everywhere on the ground. No one was moving. The people didn't look as if they were asleep. They looked as if they were dead. Those poor people, said Mr. Billy Ring, and laughed. The train continued on slowly, and Bond saw more and more bodies of men, women, and children. 
He looked carefully to see if any of them were moving, but they weren't. There was no sound at all. At last, the train stopped at the sidings near the bullion depository. All the leaders of the gangs and their people were wearing their protective equipment. The doors of the train opened, and different groups of men and women got down onto the platform. One group of men, the assault group, was carrying the atomic bomb. The five gang leaders were in the command group with Goldfinger, Oddjob, Bond, and Tilly. Goldfinger ordered them to climb onto the roof of the first train carriage. From this position, they could watch the assault group running towards the bullion depository. They've gone through the gates, said Mr. Jack Strap excitedly. Bond looked and saw an extraordinary sight. In the middle of a large field was the huge building of the gold vault. Hundreds of bodies were lying on the ground around the vault. The soldiers were still holding their weapons. Everything was very quiet. Trucks belonging to each gang were waiting on the roads at the edge of the field. Bond looked at the bodies on the ground. Were any of the soldiers alive? None of them moved. The assault group was moving towards the main door of the vault. Goldfinger looked at Bond. His pale blue eyes were shining with triumph. I was right, and you were wrong, Mr. Bond. Soon I will be the richest man in the world. And then we will say goodbye. Thank you for the help which you and Miss Masterton have given me. Bond knew that he and Tilly were not important to Goldfinger any more. Very soon Goldfinger was going to give an order and Bond and Tilly would be killed. But Bond had decided that, whatever happened to him, he would kill Goldfinger first. Suddenly, Bond saw something moving high in the sky above them. It was a helicopter, and it was flying fast towards the depository. Then everything happened at once. The dead soldiers suddenly jumped up from the ground and pointed their weapons at the assault group. Now troops were guarding the door of the vault again. A loud voice came from a loudspeaker in the helicopter. It gave the order, Stand where you are! Drop your weapons! But then the shooting started. Bond grabbed Tilly's hand and jumped down from the roof of the train carriage onto the platform. He heard Goldfinger shouting to Oddjob, Get Bond and the girl! Kill them! Oddjob started running down the platform. Run, Tilly! Run! shouted Bond. He began pulling Tilly along the platform, but she let go of his hand and tried to climb into one of the carriages of the train. Bond stopped, took the knife out of his trouser belt and turned towards Oddjob. Oddjob stopped running, pulled off his bowler hat and threw it at Tilly. It struck her on the neck. Without a sound, she fell backwards onto the platform in front of him. Oddjob leapt towards Bond and tried to kick him. But Tilly was in his way, and he missed Bond. Bond swung his knife at Oddjob, but the Korean knocked it out of his hand. Oddjob leapt at Bond again. His feet struck Bond's shoulder, and Bond fell to the ground. A powerful kick had sent a terrible pain through Bond's body. For a few seconds, Bond closed his eyes and waited for Oddjob's next kick. But nothing happened. Suddenly, Bond heard the sound of three long, loud blasts from the train's horn, and he looked up. To his surprise, he saw Oddjob running away from him. He was running along the platform towards the train. The train had begun to move. Oddjob caught up with it, jumped up into a carriage, and disappeared inside. Bond stood up, holding his painful shoulder. Suddenly, he heard a shout behind him. He turned and saw Felix Leiter running towards him. The FBI agent was wearing a military uniform. Bond walked along the platform. He was very happy to see his good friend again. So, you got my message about Goldfinger's plan, said Bond. Yes, said Felix, smiling. We arrested the members of Goldfinger's staff who were going to put the drug in the water supply. But we wanted to trap Goldfinger, too. We had found out about his plan, but we didn't want him to suspect anything. So we pretended that everyone in Fort Knox had drunk the water and died. But Goldfinger has escaped, said Bond. He's driving the train. Our job and the gang leaders are with him. One of our planes is above the train now, replied Felix. It'll follow the train. We'll catch Goldfinger. Thank you for saving my life, said Bond. But I'm afraid that it's too late to save Tilly Masterton.
He walked with Felix to where Tilly was lying on the ground. The girl's neck was broken, and she was dead. Bond stood and looked down at her. He felt sad as he remembered the proud, pretty girl in her Triumph sports car. Chapter 12 Goldfinger's Last Flight Two days later, Felix Leiter was driving Bond to Idlewild Airport in New York. M had told Bond to return to the Secret Service headquarters, so Bond was catching the next plane to London. What's happened to Goldfinger? asked Bond. We don't know, said Felix. My men caught up at the train, but there was no one on it. Goldfinger and Odd Job had got off somewhere. So had the gang leaders. We don't know where they went. Bond wasn't happy about the way that the mission had ended. The robbery of Fort Knox had been stopped, but Bond hadn't caught Goldfinger, and he hadn't got the Bank of England's gold back. The five gang leaders had also escaped. Two English girls, Jill and Tilly Masterton, had been murdered, and Goldfinger was still free. When they got to Idlewild, Bond said goodbye to Felix and went inside the airport. He had some time before his flight departed, so he planned to have a drink and do some shopping. Suddenly, he heard an announcement from the loudspeaker system. Well, Mr. James Bond, a passenger on BOAC flight number 510 to London, please come to the BOAC ticket counter. Bond walked across to the ticket counter. Please, can I see your health certificate? said the official behind the desk. Bond took out his certificate from his passport and handed it to the official. I'm very sorry, sir, said the man, but your flight is going via Gander in Canada. Your plane has to land there to get fuel. We've been told that there's a case of typhoid at Gander. The authorities have given an order. All passengers traveling via Gander must have protection from typhoid. You must have an injection. Bond hated injections. He looked around the area near the BOAC departure gate. It was empty. This was strange. Where are the other passengers, he asked. They're having their injections now, said the official, pointing behind the desk. Please, follow me, sir. It will only take a minute. All right. Bond stepped behind the ticket counter and followed the man through a door into an office. A doctor was waiting there. He was dressed in a white coat, and he was holding a needle and syringe. Please, take off your jacket and pull up the sleeve of your shirt he said to Bond. A minute later, Bond felt the sharp needle go into his arm as the doctor gave him the injection. Thanks, Bond said. He pulled down his sleeve and tried to pick up his jacket, but he couldn't reach it. His hand went down, down towards the floor, and his body followed, down, down, down. When Bond woke up, he was in a plane with lots of empty seats, all the lights were on inside the plane. Outside, the sky was dark. Bond looked down at his arms. His hands were tied to his seat. What had happened? Bond glanced to his right and got a terrible shock. Odd job was sitting there, and he was dressed in a BOAC airline uniform. When Odd job saw that Bond was awake, he rang a bell. A minute later, Pussy Galore appeared. She was also wearing a BOAC airline uniform. Hi, handsome, she said. What's going on? asked Bond in astonishment. Don't get excited, she said, smiling. She walked slowly past him and disappeared into the cockpit. A few minutes later, Goldfinger came out of the cockpit and walked towards Bond. He was wearing a BOAC airline pilot's uniform. Well, Mr. Bond, he said. I made a big mistake about you. I should have killed you and the girl when I had the opportunity. And now I have a lot of questions to ask you. I'll answer your questions, Goldfinger, said Bond. But first, untie my hands and bring me some bourbon whiskey. All right, said Goldfinger. Or job, untie Mr. Bond's hands. Ring the bell to call Miss Galore. Then get into the seat in front of Mr. Bond. You must not let him get past you to the cockpit of the plane. A few minutes later, Pussy Galore brought Bond a glass of whiskey. 
Goldfinger sat in the seat opposite Bond and waited for him to speak. Bond picked up his glass. Suddenly he saw a small piece of paper stuck to the bottom of the glass. Quickly he drank all the whiskey and read the words through the bottom of the glass. I want to work with you. Love, P. Now then, Goldfinger, said Bond, turning to look at the red-haired master criminal. What happened? And where are we going? I left the train at the siding where three of my trucks were waiting, said Goldfinger. One truck was carrying all my gold bullion, which I had taken out of the bank in New York. I shot all the gang leaders, except Miss Galore, Goldfinger continued. Then I called Moscow and spoke to my friends in Smirsh. I believe that you know them. I told them what had happened. They recognized your name, Mr. Bond. They told me that you are Agent 007, a member of the British Secret Service. Then I understood everything very clearly. My friends want to ask you many questions, Goldfinger went on. So I decided to bring you to the Soviet Union. My German employees are pilots. They tied up the BOAC staff at Idlewild Airport, and we changed clothes with them. It was easy to trick you and give you an injection. Then we stole the BOAC plane, loaded all the gold bullion into it, and took off. Now we are on our way to Moscow. Goldfinger smiled, but his eyes were cold and cruel. Mr. Bond, we have made a bargain, he said sharply. Now you must tell me everything. Who ordered you to follow me? And how were you able to destroy my plans? Bond told Goldfinger some of the truth, but he didn't tell him everything. So you see, Goldfinger, you only just escaped, he said at last. If Tilly Masterton hadn't gone to Geneva, my mission would have succeeded. The police would have caught you, and you would be in prison now. Goldfinger went back into the cockpit, and the plane flew on over the dark land. Pussy Galore brought Bond a plate of sandwiches. He was hungry, and ate them quickly. She'd put a white napkin under the sandwiches. Inside the napkin, Bond found a pen. Pussy was working with him. Most of the lights inside the plane had now been turned off. Bond sat and thought as fast as he could. Goldfinger must not escape again, he said to himself. The plane mustn't reach Moscow. It must make an emergency landing. But how can I make Goldfinger land the plane? Perhaps I can start a fire. Then suddenly Bond had a plan. It was a mad, frightening, terrible idea. He didn't know if the plan would work, but it was his only chance. He wrote a message on the white napkin. When Pussy Galore walked past his seat, he dropped the napkin onto the floor. Pussy picked it up and read the message. I've thought of a plan. Go and sit down. Fasten your seatbelt. Love, Jay. Good luck, handsome, said Pussy softly, and she kissed him. Then she walked to her seat near the cockpit. Odd Job was sitting in the seat in front of Bond. Bond could see the Korean's face reflected in the window next to the seat. Odd Job wasn't asleep. He was staring straight ahead, and his powerful hands were on his knees. Bond was waiting for Odd Job to become tired and sleep, but Odd Job didn't move. One hour passed, then two. Bond pretended to fall asleep himself. He made a soft noise through his nose. Then at last, Odd Job turned his head and moved in his seat so that he was more comfortable. This was the opportunity that Bond had been waiting for. Quietly, he took the small knife out from the heel of his shoe. Then, very, very slowly, he moved his hand towards the window next to Odd Job. Holding his seat belt tightly with one hand and the knife in the other, Bond pointed the knife at the center of the window. Suddenly, he struck the center of the window with the knife. Immediately, there was a bang and a loud whistling noise. The air in the plane began to rush out through the hole in the window. Suddenly, Odd Job's body was pulled violently towards the hole. The air was rushing out of the broken window with a terrible force, and it was taking Odd Job's body with it. There was a crash as Odd Job's head went through the window, 
and his shoulders hit the window frame. Then Arjob's whole body was pulled slowly out of the plane. His chest went through, then his stomach and his legs. Bond held onto his seatbelt with all his strength. The huge plane went into a steep dive and began to fall. Bond heard the scream of the engines as the plane went down, faster and faster. Plates, glasses, papers and pillows disappeared out through the broken window. Now there wasn't enough oxygen inside the plane, and Bond couldn't breathe. In a few seconds, he became unconscious. Bond woke up when someone kicked him hard. He cried out in pain, and he tasted blood in his mouth. The person's foot struck Bond's chest, and then his stomach. Bond opened his eyes. All the lights were on in the plane, and it was very cold. Goldfinger was standing over Bond. His face was angry and cruel. He was pointing a small gun at Bond. Bond grabbed Goldfinger's foot and pulled it violently to one side. Goldfinger screamed in pain and fell to the floor. Bond leapt onto Goldfinger and closed his fingers around Goldfinger's throat. At the same time, Goldfinger closed his own fingers around Bond's throat. Bond pressed his hands together as hard as he could. He felt the terrible strength of Goldfinger's hands around his own neck. Who would die first, Goldfinger or him? Goldfinger's large face was becoming red, and a terrible noise was coming out of his mouth. At last, his hands around Bond's throat became weaker. Then he made a final terrible noise and lay still. He'd stopped breathing. He was dead. Bond stood up slowly. Goldfinger's small gun was lying on the floor. Bond picked it up and walked towards the cockpit. Pussy Galore was fastened in her seat by her seatbelt, but she was unconscious. Bond got down onto his knees beside her. He blew air into Pussy's mouth until she was conscious and breathing normally again. Then he opened the door of the cockpit. Inside the cockpit there were five men. They were all members of Goldfinger's German staff. Bond pointed the gun at the frightened men. Goldfinger is dead, said Bond loudly. If anyone moves or disobeys an order, I'll kill him. Pilot, what's our position? The pilot told Bond that they were flying over the Atlantic Ocean, towards the coast of Canada. But he also said that they didn't have enough fuel to reach an airport in Canada. Bond knew that they were all in terrible danger. The plane would have to land in the sea. He sent out a call on the radio. The message said that the plane would be making an emergency landing into the sea. The men on a weather ship in the Atlantic heard his call. They told him that they would fire flares. When the pilot saw the flares, he could guide the plane down to the position of the weather ship. As soon as the plane hits the water, Bond told the five men in the cockpit, I'll open the doors so that you can get out. But if you try to leave the cockpit before then, I'll shoot you. Bond stepped backwards out of the cockpit and closed the door. He went to Pussy Galore and told her what was going to happen. They both put on life jackets, and he told her to kneel down on the floor with her head on the seat. Then Bond got down on his knees too and held her body tightly against his own. The plane crashed into the sea at about a hundred miles an hour. As it hit the water, it broke in two pieces. Bond and Pussy were thrown out of the plane and into the ice-cold sea. The weight of the heavy gold bullion on board the plane quickly pulled it down to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Pussy and Bond were the only people to escape from the plane. They floated in the cold water until men from the weather ship came to rescue them. The five German men in the cockpit were carrying bags of gold, and the weight of the bullion pulled them down to the bottom of the ocean. Bond and Pussy were given a wonderful welcome on the weather ship. But before they were taken to their cabins to rest, Bond had answered a lot of questions. He'd also spoken to M on the ship's radio. After he'd spoken to his boss, Bond had walked slowly to his cabin. He'd taken a hot shower and put on dry clothes. Now he was feeling very tired. He was lying on the bed in his cabin drinking whiskey. Suddenly the door opened and Pussy came in. She was wearing only a large grey woolen jersey. She no longer looked like a tough gangster. She looked like a young girl. Bond looked at her pale, beautiful face and her violet eyes and smiled. You need some TLC, he said. 
What's TLC? Tender loving care. I'd like that, said Pussy. She pushed Bond's black hair off his face and looked into his grey blue eyes. When is it going to start? Now, said Bond, and kissed her hard on the mouth.